you know, if that doesn't mean anything, is it means this is that, you know, we're going to talk about things that most people won't talk about. We're going to ask questions that most people refuse to. And that's been my nature all my life. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to open some more nuts here. Nice. Nice. Well, I relate to you, brother. I served in the Navy too. I was an Airedale myself. I, uh, I know. I, follow, I, follow, I see you the next quid. <laughs> so. so we're on the same page. Right on. Yeah. You know, a bunch of us nukes had problems with security clearances and things like that. You know, especially if you had any fighting boxing background at all, you know, in the service back then and stuff. So. Oh, the smokers? Yeah. Yeah. Did you, you want someone who could fight, you know, like, <laughs> in the military? Just think it. Like, what, why would that skill be? I mean, I can understand if you had a criminal record, but this seems logical. Like, so, I took boxing. Oh, well, well you're a security clearance. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't envision what it would be, you know. No, no, it's only if you apply that skill while you're in the service. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, only if you're not an officer. <laughs> <laughs> I get you, I get you. Welcome to the January 13th edition of the Electric View. I'm Neil Thompson. Today we have Edward, Robert, Robert, Heather, Buddy, Richard, Eugene, Sheep, Jim, James, Dave, and our very special guest, Chris Fontaine. We explore the background and history of the ideas behind cooperative electrical science and what may be in store for our future. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. It's great to meet everyone. Mate, nice talking to everyone. Is that Eugene there? Yeah, looks like that. <laughs> hey, Eugene. <laughs> James is here. Too. I, you know, I still have that card you gave me at the conference in 2015. It's sitting on my visor, my Jeep. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah it's really cool when I look up there. Occasionally, I'll see it and remind me of it. It's good. It's good to see. Good to see you again. Talk to you again. Yeah. I'm also glad that you, you've been able to join us. Yeah. Thank you. I've been following all your work. You're just truly amazing. Uh, your level of understanding and rational thinking is, um, you know, brings me around back home sometimes. Makes me dig deeper, you know, for answers. So that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah, that, that's what we do in this community, you know. Right. We're trying, trying to dig deeper. Right. Absolutely. Look at, looking for answers. Well, it was almost four years ago when I said to you that I, I see you as a future leader in the Electric Universe community, and I think you've come. I think you've come into your own since then. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Although my personality is certainly not that of a leader, uh, I prefer, you know, research to more uh, administrative work or something like that so well when you're when you're cutting edge you can't help but lead it's true people look up to you and you think they were we're like i'm like i'm surprised when someone comes up and goes i've been watching blah, blah, blah. i'm like really <laughs> these are just my friends and we're just hanging out but if you think that we're awesome that's great it makes me feel good <laughs> and great discussions i follow y'all podcast as well listen to just about everything uh, i was watching that recent thing y'all were doing on the um uh, entry of that comet trajectory and everything that was a brilliant discussion that is pretty awesome we've well, yeah, it's been pretty exciting to, to see that whole coming together thing. so with yeah. jim and, and, and eugene and stuff too as well Absolutely. So I hope you can join our Skype group yes. because that, that gets lively through the, throughout the week. It goes through different cycles of, of uh, activity and stuff. But the, 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 the ideas are always pretty fun to, to uh, interact with them. Everyone's ideas. Yes. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. We don't always have a, yeah, we don't always have like a big uh, like interview like this. Uh, sometimes we're having, uh, you know, just a regular, uh, just the conversation. Well, I think the only quote is attributed to Einstein that I ever repeat is that we're only limited by what we know. Our imagination has no limits. So I would ask you guys just to bear with me. These are concepts that were established and ideas that were 
purveyed long before I live. And um, we're going to have an open discussion on them. Hopefully we can get to the bottom of it, or at least shed some light on how it's possible, if it's possible. I am up to it. So, Dave, uh, I just went through some. I went through some of uh, some of the material on your Facebook page, etc. So, I'm kind of into the uh, the idea of, of whatever's going to inspire like a, a discussion or, or, or a, a direction that you'd like to talk about today. We can kind of follow that. And uh, there's some really fascinating things that you discuss here, and there's certainly things that are scary in the process. And uh, but I think it's certainly worth addressing and. And you know, bringing bring, bringing to light, or and at least at least uh, different perspectives on. Absolutely. Well, I I think the gist of the discussion today will be uh, based on Tesla's quote, and I'll reference yeah. it. Um, I man, could, I saw. yeah, man could tap the breast of Mother Sun and release her energy toward Earth as needed, magnetic as well as light. End quote. And I, I think that you know, I think. That is the that's that's the big question. How do we do that? So, can we do that? Is it possible for mankind to affect in any way the function of the sun, so our sun? And that's where I'd like to begin the conversation about how does the Earth obtain its electrical potential? How, what creates the heat in the atmosphere of the Earth and the sun? What is often uh, ohmic heating, ionic heating? occurring in the upper atmosphere of Earth and the Sun. So, uh, and we know about the Berkman current filament connection, so we'll probably need to talk about how it's a base locked loop circuit and the possibility of perturbing that circuit throughout a phase sequence uh, perturbation of our upper atmosphere. So, Alphan waves, everyone's familiar with Hannes Alphan's work in uh, you know, hydrodynamics, and I think the only thing that was, he that he did come out after his, was awarded the um, Nobel Prize was that they were not frozen in lines of magnetic force. So I agree with that. And, and so we can get past that discussion about how he rejected his own theory and move on to how the theory is actually an application right now. So um, I, I don't want to occupy the mic that entire time of discussion, but what I would like to say is that who is familiar with uh, research in alpha wave and ionospheric perturbations? I would say a little bit. I think a lot of Maybe us have played around. A little bit too. Yeah, we a played around. Bit, yeah. We talked. Uh, I'm pretty sure that me, Jim, and Eugene, and others have had uh, have talked about atmospheric connections, especially with regards to the sun, or just trying to figure out the circuits and so forth. Okay. Well, typically, um, well, the initial, the first. High altitude nuclear detonations created alpha and wave perturbations, and that was in the late 50s, I believe, was the first ones. Argus, I believe, was one of the first uh, attempts that was publicized. So, you know, we think about how this is possible to, to create a, 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 a cluster of ions traveling around a waveguide, a circuit in the uh, you know, circumnavigating the planet, and in fact, that's what we talk about the Schumann resonance and how they're created, uh, and uh, elves and sprites and all these other phenomena um, are a product of that electric force created through an alpha wave circuit traveling around the, the Earth in a, 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 a dynamic motion that creates that electrical force. So, you know, I, I believe it, it works both ways. It's a swinging door, so we can actually induce a circuit, or that circuit can, uh, electric force can induce a magnetic field. So, magnetic field can induce an electrical circuit, or electrical circuit can induce a magnetic field. One and the same, they have to be there. So, I think that's a discussion to have is how does uh, anthropogenic space weather, the artificial perturbation of alpha waves, in Earth's upper atmosphere affect not only our own planet, but the sun itself. And um, in that conversation, I think is possible through the understanding of Berkman filament connections and um, and their structure as discussed by Don Scott, uh, that we may be able to understand that, that, that connection and how or, or mankind possibly can affect his environment in, that such, in such a way. 
Nice. So, um, when we talk about the Earth's atmospheric conductivity and, and research on um, ion measurements um, in the atmosphere and with the counts are, and in fact, uh, Clifford Cornicom did some research on atmospheric con conductivity. He's done a lot of other research as well on Morgellons disease and other things, but I think his research on atmospheric conductivity is the most critical point to make. As he's determined that over a period of time that he did his studies, that he detected a 233% increase in ions in the atmosphere. So how does that affect us? Is uh, the atmosphere, uh, are we swimming in electromagnetic radiation? Yes. Is all of it natural? No. Uh, what effect does it have on humanity? Is there a biological effect from non-ionizing radiation? Absolutely. How does it occur? Well, study the research on uh, uh, voltage-gated ion channeling in the body and how electromagnetic radiation affects the mitochondrial double layers, just exactly the way it does in the upper atmosphere. So, you know, uh, the discussion is to have is to, to understand how we're tuned in to this electrical circuit and the body, the earth, and all life on it uh, exist um, at the behest of those frequencies. Um, our hearts and our minds resonate to the vibrations of the, of the Schumann cavity. So how does that Schumann cavity vibrate? What causes that vibration? So, I'm opening a door for a lot of questions. My, mainstream scientists say that lightning causes alpha waves. And like I said, I believe a lightning strike can perturb an alpha wave. But is that the predominant factor in which it happens? I doubt it. I think it's an electrical force from the exterior of the planet, the sun, that powers this phenomenon of the upper atmosphere and um, even the thermal radiation that's emitted in the upper atmosphere. We're talking about temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're talking about alpha temperatures. So uh, what can they exist as and what, what electronal potential do they have? Well, they're significant. In fact, uh, it's very possible that those perturbations cause heating in the upper atmosphere, which is the predominant cause of heating or cooling on our planet. At what rate are they doing it? How long have they been doing it? And why isn't that a conflict, part of the conversation? on climate change? That's a good question. Do you also think we're just budget. locked into, in, into the model, the existing model? And, Absolutely. And they found out how it worked. They figured out how it worked. They're just not telling anybody. That, that, that's, what, that's always been my, you know, the, the, kind of, the, there's a premise of like a knowledge that, or a feeling, more of a feeling, that that's how it is. But, but so do, you, do you have support for that? That it's been, it, it feels to me that it's been known for a long time. It's just that this is a, this is a model that they built in order to contain everyone's you know way of looking at the universe. I think it's an ancient uh, knowledge. I think we've now figured out how to do it with modern technology. I think the pyramids, in some fashion, maintain an oscillation of the planet, maybe balance, maybe electrical tensions between points in space. I don't know. There's a lot of questions out there, but I don't believe there are burial chambers. John, uh, right, right. Could they have created oscillations within the human cavity as an interface between telluric currents and atmospheric currents, ionospheric currents? Possibly. I think that's the problem. That's the that's the question. Is what, how does the interface occur? We know that there's a precursor and uh, high uh, total electron content above. Uh, epicenters of earthquakes uh, around the world. They study that and they indicate that it happens as a practice. So um, how is it possible that the natural phenomena can be duplicated and recreated artificially? And if they are doing it artificially to create movement of, movement of, of seismic plates or I don't believe in tectonic plates, but in any case uh, to create vibrations underneath the planet, is it possible they're doing it to to prevent a larger earthquake from occurring? I don't know. You know, are they saving us or are they just trying to control it? Right. 
Right. So, so essentially, you're saying that uh, there is some they uh, who know all this stuff, but, but how can they uh, contain this knowledge? I mean, why isn't it spreading out? Well, it's interesting that you say that because I also had that same thought, and it was like if that if if you're talking about like an energetic connectivity between everyone, and at one point some sort of knowledge is unlocked or understood, then that vibration will ripple through the connectivity of everyone, which would make everyone more receptive to it and open to it, and people start having realizations along the lines of what they know without them having to tell us. Well, I think those are good questions, and and here's the thing: is that when I speak in terms of they, I'm talking about the people that collectively that Tesla said and spoke publicly about that those locations around the planet would have to come together. And those locations, in fact, were plotted in the study that I saw on where the ionosphere keters would have to be located uh, geographically. And all of those locations had to come under, under one wing of management. Who runs that? I know the World Meteorological Organization sponsors the proliferation of dipole-based array radar systems around the globe. They fund it. We know that that does. In fact, I just posted this morning an article on uh, uh, what they call non-ionizing radiation radar in a pencil beam formation creating ionization potential. So what I'm saying is that they're saying it's non-ionizing if it does uh, cause uh, an electron to be ejected from a molecule or an atom, then it is ionizing. Therefore, we can determine what the cascade effect might be, uh, what the charge separation might be in the atmosphere with the use of dipole-based ray systems. Uh, all these things are questions. So how it all comes together is a million pieces of the puzzle. How the work, how the Earth is charged electrically. We know it's an ext externally powered, typically, but can we manifest a recreation of that natural phenomenon? And I say, yes, they are. And it's open for discussion. I'm putting it on the table. What's, what's the motivation for what they're doing? To, to me, you know, there's, there's quite a few data points here, and I, you know, I'm not sure which one, to t which one to pull up first, but... I think but, that... Uh, I think that the idea is control. And, you know, he who controls the sun controls life on planet Earth. So, and, and throughout the solar system. So, control of the electrical circuit. And, and what we're talking about in the past is someone said something about uh, the, the Saturn being more luminous than the sun, right? Well, in fact, the data shows that Earth is more luminous than the sun right now in the microwave spectrum. That is true. We give up on microwaves. Absolutely. So I'm saying, is it in which light, in which, what type of luminosity, what range exactly. of frequency? What spectrum of light are we observing these phenomena? It was so, Robitaille, wasn't it? The, the one who pointed out that water of our planet gives yeah, off the microwave. Constant microwave background yes. is brought in the oceans, that's right. I thought that was a brilliant idea because of the way that his proof had to do with the way the layup was and the way that the satellite was turning. I thought that was brilliant. Genius, but the Robitaille truly is a, a, a brilliant man. I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with all of his theories on uh, liquid metal, and I don't. You know, uh, Wall just said last week that he didn't either. So, um, but there's no reason to worry about that. I mean, that, there, that's my opinion. Well, this is an externally powered phenomena. I'm down to discuss an anode sun or a plasmoid sun, which, in my opinion, is more likely the product of of what I see and, uh, it, you know, but just research on the topic of plasmoid phenomena on the sun and we talk about throughout the sun, the, the universe is a plasmoids or the power. Steve Smith and I are about an hour and a half apart and we visited a number of times and and here at my house and, and um, we talked about the plasmoid phenomenon. For my birthday a couple of years ago, he posted that, that video out and I was you know, glad to know that our conversation had an impact. But the kind of electric plasmoid sun does not contradict Robitaille's model. That's uh, in fact, in fact, they might support each other. That's um, exactly what I said, Eugene. I said they neither were mutually exclusive, so there's no reason to argue the, the model. 
I'm just saying is that uh, if we do talk about the phenomena of, <clears throat> of a plasma with sun and we talk about it as a condensed matter phenomena, I'm not sure if that contradicts or not. I'd have to probably speak with Robert Ty directly to see how he felt about it. And we were talking it's, about this just a moment ago. You keep those you posted something about the thousand uh, the atmosphere depth of uh, Jupiter and uh, how it's they say it's not really a solid body, but it acts like a solid body at that depth and we were like kinda laughing. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so so just to fill everyone in, so to speak, uh, this Juno space probe that is orbiting Jupiter right now. So they've found with their measurements of gravity and magnetism around Jupiter that uh, uh, beyond, like below 3,000 kilometers of the, you know, the top of the atmosphere, uh, Jupiter rotates like a solid body. So it's like a rigid ball. Uh, so there's no differential rotation anymore, and no, no things like that. Uh, and, and so, well, it, it was actually kind of my idea, not only mine probably, but, but I was considering Jupiter as being a solid body, not a gas giant, you know. Uh, so it kind of confirmed, confirmed this idea. Uh, but of course, again, NASA scientists, they say that, oh, it must be, you know, liquid or gas, but it's just, you know, it's just rotating like a solid body because there's magnetism or something else involved and things like that. But, but, but what it seems to be is actually a solid body. But at the, uh, the, the atmosphere above those 3,000 kilometers of atmosphere, uh, they actually demonstrate this counter rotation that, you know, Don Scott's Birkeland currents have. So this is another very interesting point. And, and I have to note that on Earth, we also have counter-rotating atmospheric areas, you know, these uh, cells of global circulation, which, which both, I mean, both Jupiter and Earth, in this case, uh, this counter-rotation might be an evidence for some sort of kind of like Birkeland current, you know, falling in from the poles. Um, but that is uh, um, that is so far an intuitive notion rather than an actual observable fact. I mean, to say there is a Birkeland current, we need to actually register this current in some way. I mean, maybe maybe there is some particle that we don't yet know about, or some types of field that we don't yet know about, or don't have a method to, of detection. You know. Um, Eugene, I, I think we research. I think NASA actually does. In fact, the, the, what I see is NASA is recording magnetic fields, right? And all the magnetic fields we know are a product of an electric force. So if we know the magnetic field is a product of an electric force, then we have to wonder if it it may be scalable. Is there an order of magnitude? Is there a smaller force occurring that is representative of the electric field that we observe? So maybe it's a, a, a dipole moment in, a, in the ether that we're observing as these connecting phenomena, you know, along the Birkeland current center core filament. You know, I don't know. I love the model Don Scott came up with. I appreciate all he's done. And, and, and uh, wow, what a, what a addition to the electric universe. Yeah, we, we actually had a brief discussion on this uh, in some of the earlier podcasts. So the topic was, can we actually detect, do we even able, you know, with, with having only those tiny space probes, uh, do we actually, are we actually able to detect some, you know, large scale fields or, or you know, those, those types of currents or fields that are spanning the whole planet, basically. Because maybe if the probe is just measuring something in one point, it would, it would measure, you know, the, the same kind of field all around it, even though on the larger scale, there would be a much, much more significant, I don't know, potential difference or whatever. And, and we would just not be able to measure that because we, we only have, you know, this one data point at some point in space. 
I, I agree. And we are, we tend to observe the planets around us to try to understand, I guess, how our own planet works, when in reality, there's significant atmospheric research, uh, upper atmospheric research is going on that that is detected. D1, D2 satellite missions, polar satellites, the tide satellite missions as well detected. Uh, ion acceleration um, from both poles. In fact, uh, they detected water exhausting out of both both poles at a considerable rate. So the range of that of that radii was eight and a half Earth radii uh, from the poles above the poles that they observed that ion acceleration and considerable acceleration, I might add. You know, you look at um, um, the work down in the South Pole and all the ionospheric research taking place down there, and the, uh, I think it's a deep uh, the, the Q project where they're measuring neutrinos, and uh, and and the recent discovery of a, a, a phenomena that's accelerating ions from deep within the Earth, and they're detecting it from the wrong direction, or it's coming completely through the Earth. You got to see that before. Yeah. So I, I just have a one. And a brief, a, a small addition to what I've already said. So, uh, the, I think the only occasion when people actually kind of try to deal with those uh, of the slightly larger scale phenomena, at least of tens of kilometers in size, was with, with the tether experiments in Earth's orbit uh, in, in space shuttle missions. Uh, and you, you probably know how that ended, right? So, yes. At one time, they, they didn't deploy the tether. Well, okay, that, that's not, not not really related. But uh, on another occasion, it just just fried from from the electric current that we're running through it, and it was only like maybe ten or twenty kilometers long, or maybe even two kilometers. I'm not sure. They actually did perturb an alpha wave from the tether experiments as well, uh, Eugene. I don't know if you're familiar with that research. Yeah, they actually did. There was an alpha wave. That's another mechanism by which to perturb an alpha wave in the upper atmosphere is through a tether. So, you know, it's interesting that all these research uh, and all the studies that I see of upper atmosphere of Earth are designed to understand how the ionosphere radiation belts or um, the layers of the ionosphere interact or are what they're calling this couple. Right with the magnetosphere and the uh, thermosphere of Earth, and and therefore, you know how that coupling effect occurs. I think they're really searching for that Birkeland current filament connection, because everything they're observing is saying that there is definitely an acceleration to and from Earth to the to the Sun. Uh, that's my opinion on that. Well, you're. Probably uh, well. Like this is the thing. Me and Dave have this wonderful argument all the time. Is it, is it intentional? Like you guys, or is it? I I, I tend to uh, I tend to leave it on the side of ignorance first. But still, uh, there's. Uh, I mean, think that somebody at like JPL would like get like a little deep, you know, where NASA would look up and go, huh? You know, like so. There's a little bit to what you say. I mean, it's clear that they're not telling you absolutely everything. I mean, it's not like we all knew that when the space shuttle was made, they were advertising it as a space plane. But little did we know that their main goal was to grab satellites out of orbit and Russia or other country satellites that work on them and put them back into space. And no, no one even thought about that, but you know, they did. <laughs> but yeah. I, anyway, I, I just wanted to understand. add before we before we go, I just wanted to point out your wonderful situation there. Uh, the the reason that it's really a concern about the solid surface part is because of the mass of these bodies, Jupiter and, and the Sun. The, the, the big conundrum is how can something be solid yet be so light, or you know, according to the gravity uh, that's supposed to have, or mass. So, uh, but that's the big conundrum. I'll leave you to go then. But. Right on. Well, I, you know, we were talking about, um, I, I think the point of, of discussion was uh, how does Earth interface, how does mankind interface with our environment? And is it possible for us to manipulate uh, solar activity or even for that matter, anthropogenic space weather? And there's a number of different studies recently uh, on that topic of, uh, of atmospheric research and how 
uh, the angle of perturbation of the electro jets perturb either the blowout or create stabilized plasmoid phenomena in the upper atmosphere. So we're looking at uh, collisional and collisionless um, plasmoid phenomena in the upper atmosphere. I'm calling it a, a plasmoid instability in the upper atmosphere of Earth. Very similar to what you know, I think we, we've seen at the center of the galaxy and, uh, and how that phenomena may or may not be uh, uh, manipulated you know, artificially. So uh, I think it's important to consider what the, the possibility are with solar radiation management and how that might affect the atmospheric conductivity with aerosol particulates and nanoparticulates uh, dispersed artificially. And naturally, you know, fires dispose, and volcanoes disperse the most aerosols, I think. And we know the studies of certain scientists that discovered cosmic radiation interface with with aerosols create cloud formations. And how does that affect weather? Um, there was a company, Aqueous, that did work on uh, directing atmospheric rivers, essentially uh, pushing water into regions that don't normally see that atmospheric river overhead so uh and creating like chime is have now started a large uh, geoengineering project especially designed to bring rainfall to some of the deserts in north northwest of china have you heard about it i have in fact uh, i see a lot of finger pointing on that note eugene uh, we're, we're saying that Russia's doing it, we're saying Chinese did it for the Olympics there, that they cleared the sky, and they say how they did it with cannon fire and rockets and other things. So I don't know, they're not revealing the electromagnetic component to the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole idea of geoengineering. They're talking about the aerosol dispersion. And now it's publicly recognized that it's going on, right? So, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started talking about geoengineering and chemtrailing is, is what it was called back then. But that's not a term that the conspiracy theorists made up. That was in an Air Force document. That's where that was picked up from. So anyway, you know, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about me being validated on the topic of artificially, uh, you know, uh, spraying nanoparticulates or aerosols and dispersing them artificially. There's a natural phenomena that occur that disperse far more than chemtrails could. But, um, you know, fires, we've been having fires in Northern California. Uh, that's a concern. What is the spark gap, right? Standard for power lines now. Is it changed? We know that the atmospheric conductivity has increased. Is, is that reflected in our standards for our power lines? Those are good questions. Yeah, well, I would like to briefly return to the topic of possible, you know, control of solar activity. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not claiming anything. I'm just, I just want to hear your opinion. Uh, have, you hear, have you heard about the phenomenon of Earth-facing solar quiet that Ben Davidson frequently talks about? So, so just Again, for everyone to understand what, what I mean by that, it, it's the observation that somehow uh, sunspots very rarely produce strong flares towards the Earth and coronal mass ejections too. So they, and I've actually observed that a lot of times, like the sunspot appears, uh, the, the eastern limb, uh, it starts flaring like really violently, for example, there's a period of high solar activity, but then it, when it appears, when it kind of moves towards the center of the sun, so that it's directly against the Earth, it suddenly kind of quiets down, you know, and then when it moves away from Earth, again, to the opposite side of the sun, it starts flaring again. So, do you think there might be some connections to what, what humans are doing on this planet, or well, Eugene, that's a brilliant observation, and, and the fact is, is that Tesla covered that in this in that quote. He said, "Man could tap the breast of Mother Sun and release energy towards Earth as needed, right? Magnetic as well as light." And so I'm saying that we've obviously determined that we could maybe induce potential along another 
collimated beam form through directed energy technology and create a, 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 you know, some type of perturbation on the sun toward another planet. We know that NASA's observed uh, climate change on other planets. So a while back there was a study that was saying that climate change on other planets is going, is, you know, is going through the roof. So you know, we know there's a change going on, whether it's a natural phenomena. I think there is a natural long-term cycle. Are we trying to determine how that occurs and how to control it? Possibly. Uh, we, we, I think they are trying to learn how to control it, whether they're trying to control it for our benefit or for our demise. That's another question. Yeah, you know, I actually wanted to propose alternative uh, possibility for why that is observed, and that is actually heavily dependent on the rubbitized model, uh, although maybe not quite, but, but that, that's where I got this idea from. Uh, and it's not because Rubitai speaks about that, but because, you know, his ideas drew me to, to this thought. And then, uh, maybe it's actually a an effect of... Uh, so if, if the sun is condensed matter, it means that it should emit anisotropically. So it, its emission would depend on direction, right? Right. So it might just... I mean, the, the power of, of, of the emitted... Uh, radiation would depend on direction, uh, the, the direction from which you're observing. So maybe there is a, also an, an isotropy in the X-ray plus during the solar flare, so that when when it is observed at the limb of the sun, uh, it leads to higher flux than when the flaring is happening directly towards us. You know, so so it might be this an isotropical uh, effect of, of the observer, if you like, or of the angle of observation. Uh, that's so that was a, another idea I've had a couple of years ago. Well, that's that's a brilliant observation. I, like, again, like I say, Eugene, that's the point of getting into these discussions. Is there's there's perspectives on how this may occur or how it may not occur. And those perspectives is what's going to direct us to the answers that might, that are, that are being uh, forwarded right now within the electric universe community and within the geoengineering community. So that's where the crossover is. And how do how do these changes right in our electromagnetic environment through the solar calm or uh, through uh, increased solar activity? How does that affect mankind? I've seen studies uh, conducted in Scandinavia where they've shown where uh, spontaneous abortions were increased considerably during solar flare activity. Now, that's we we need to talk about these things if it's if it's we're talking about a, a sun having that sort of impact on humanity and life on this planet. So, um, you know, the process of geoengineering a planet uh, of changing the. Uh, you know, life on this planet, essentially our climate, uh, you know, involves the electromagnetic spectrum. And for the electric universe to be devoid of this conversation seems a, a bit uh, obvious to me that, that you know, we're missing something. So, May I uh, jump in for just one second? Please do. Uh, you all were just talking about a mechanism for this guided energy uh, work. And uh, I just finished reviewing this laser guided energy discharges over large air gaps and uh, I had previously had this thought that we may be able to actually post like borrow asteroids from the asteroid belt and post um, charge collection stations throughout the, the solar wind instead of trying to induce solar flares but actually collect the charge and then at certain times basically just beam it back I mean they were talking about in here a 200 uh, to 400 percent increase in distance versus uh, gapping, so right. that might be the solution. Right now, I think the commercial rollout of technology that's been developed uh, uh, covertly, probably most likely through you know through um, uh, DARPA and other uh, research facilities, even uh, universities have done a lot of this work, and now it's been publicized uh, that we can start to understand how. A, Plasma ion channeling, for instance, may increase uh, across the atmosphere that's more conductive. 
So we look at Solarin, for instance, a corporation that just recently, uh, well, in 2016, started del delivering 250 megawatts of electricity to PG&E in California. And they were doing it with satellite, uh, solar power satellite systems. And um, they signed the contract in 2009. You guys been following the fires out here in California. 2016 was not a good year. We had a lot of fires and last year again. This year, you know, everything burned. So, you know, there is some consideration for what the effects are on the power grid or induced currents into the circuit through scatter, for instance. If you beam a microwave signal down to a platform on Earth, what is the scatter through the atmosphere, through the atmosphere? How much of that energy is lost? Well, they're showing efficiencies of 90%, is what Solarin's saying. You know, some Japanese are saying they... You know, that's far-fetched, but um, that's what Solarin reported and got permitted by the state audit, uh, the state permitters on the on their uh, technology. So, you know, um, you know we're, we're far more advanced now than being told to the vast majority of the population uh, how that's developing and where we're going with that technology from here and how it's going to affect life on this planet is, a, is obviously a conversation that we need to have. So, um, good point about, you know, how that laser facility may facilitate that, that gap, that spark gap. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that came through, Buddy shared that the other day with the, uh, uh, uh <laughs> plasma discharge. Do, do you happen to have a link to that, uh, video, Buddy? I don't, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, it's great. But yeah, laser guided um, electrical impulse signals, I think. Right. All right. It's really interesting. It's got kind, of, kind of along the lines of, of uh, what we've been discussing. This is a general uh, well, they just, phenomena. Yeah. They, they just released, I uh, 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 just saw a publication this week on um, uh, they induced potential in a thunderstorm to create lightning strikes with lasers from ground positions. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that you know Star Wars programs, uh, uh, you know, initially it was designed to create a some type of protective shielding in space through advanced technology, and and now it seems like it all went away. We don't know much about what direction it went and what the technology is, but we also know that masers exist in space. Uh, Telstar, for instance, has a major communication satellite in space, and, and uh, I'm sure there's a number of others that are in military application that we're not familiar with. And the possibility of beaming, essentially beaming you know, uh, a laser to Earth and creating a plasma ion channel for discharge of ionospheric potential is there. So a thunderbolt of the gods, if you will, directed energy. You know, right. Right. They're putting lightning uh, laser beams on buildings now to direct uh, lightning strikes to ground away from uh, critical equipment. So, you know, a lot of information there. You know, right. How they're using it, how they're not using it. Is it possible to induce potential into a hurricane? Well, that's a good question. You know, can you create a... Uh, uh, a volcanic activity with induction of current or, or um, what they're calling uh, a magnetic connection between the ionosphere and telur currents. So, you know, I don't know. I think the research is there for more questions to be asked, but uh, obviously that stuff is not going to be something they're going to publicize. Right. I was watching this thing. I don't know, just to read, just to read on this because it was it was on it just struck, struck my mind. But the the winding of this uh, this tornado, you can see it tighten right before that strike. And there's an angular momentum thing to me. This angular momentum keeps playing my mind for some reason. Have you guys heard of a, a, a light phenomenon at the center of a tornadoes? Uh, Victims of tornadoes have, have recorded and witnessed uh, lightning, ball lightning phenomena in the core of a tornado. Have you guys yes. heard of this? Uh, I've also heard about the uh, someone seeing uh, the inside of the tornado itself was glowing. 
uh, much akin to what we were talking about with uh, uh, when Andy was on a while ago. We were showing uh, clouds that had a blue glow behind them, you know, um, that type of thing. So I, I, I think that's a sure sign that, uh, I mean, at this point, it's kind of odd. It's not considered electrical, but uh, uh, we noticed a similarity. Uh, if you uh, have an opportunity to listen to any of uh, the times when Jim has a chance to speak, it, uh, there was this wonderful thing he was talking about, the way the sun sits along the local chimney, and uh, it, it just became obvious to me that this is kind of a similar situation we're seeing with uh, tornadoes, the way that things can stick to the outside of a tornado, uh, apparently, uh, and like even a, like a semi-truck, you know, <laughs> Then, then fall like later. Like I don't. I, like it's just certainly not wind alone that is doing this. Clearly, but I mean, oh, see, uh, Andy Hall's uh, "Eye of the Storm" part three just he just released, and uh, that, that that talks about cyclones and mega uh, anvil anvil clouds and everything, and how they uh, circle back and forth. Oh, yeah. that, 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 that really talks about oh, just read it, Robert. Read it, right? Yeah, but clearly. Uh, definitely, we see something inside of uh, tornadoes. I think uh, we were, uh, even in the movie Twister, it was like that Bill Paxton was looking up and he saw something. Of course, that's a movie, but the uh, I guess it was based on a similar idea that there were stories, there were tales that was actually sort of, uh, you know, had a camera or their cell phone out going, yeah, yeah, I'm just getting run up by a tornado. Uh, we're just going to film this and uh, show you what it looks like. Uh, everything will be fine. I think the last, the only person I even knew that tried to do something like that was Garrett Hill, who, uh, uh, that gentleman who was, uh, uh, who was uh, doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, electrical experiments and describing them at uh, EU 2017. And he, uh, but we, we were having a conversation with him in private and one of the things that he was talking about was chasing tornadoes and they, they his idea, he was on a motorcycle with basically protective armor and try to get as close as they could to the tornado. And unfortunately, uh, uh, well, I'd say fortunately, they got scared after the truck was almost destroyed and ran away. So I give them, <laughs> thanks for being around to tell me the tale, that's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> brave boys, I would, I'd be like running for my life, I'm sure. You can do that um, apparently for only like, Fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars uh, go out there for a week and they include meals and they'll drive you around for a week and go uh, storm chasing in, uh, in America here. I don't have to chase a storm. Seems like they came to me. I rode out. <laughs> sixteen hundred bucks. Yeah. I rode out Katrina on my houseboat in Dog River. Wow. Out of wow. It blew, oh, wow. It blew 127 knots there at the marina. So, um, you know, just... Um, you know, I, I love bad weather, <laughs> you know, I don't seek it out, but I've been through a lot of it and, uh, rode out Ivan and a few other storms as well. And, and I can tell you, um, there's been a lot of talk about how to manipulate, how to create movement in a storm. And it seems to me in electric universe, we, if, if it's possible for a Doppler, next red radar systems, a dipole system to affect or ionize an atmosphere, a cloud bank, or is it possible for a laser for that matter, or a maser to induce potential in the atmosphere? Wouldn't that create movement of clouds through charge separation? Um, well, I do know that uh, we, we do put, like, that's how you uh, make those, like, cool fractal patterns in, in plexiglass. You, they use ion beams to ionize the middle of the glass, but not the edges. And that's how it makes a capacitor, and that's how you make that effect on the inside. So I can picture that you could uh, sort of beam ions, and that should, I mean, if you, I mean, just by a Coulomb's law, I mean, once you start putting them there, they're going to affect charge in their general vicinity, so that makes sense. That checks out. That checks out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I have electrical battery. Yeah. Well, but, you know, I, I don't pretend to be an electrical engineer. You guys are way smarter than me. Right, I've had to fix things you guys could. I couldn't have designed anything you guys did, but uh, I had to fix it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shows up. 
<laughs> well, I'm surrounded by really intelligent people most of my life, and, and I've been fortunate. My dad was electrical. He was electrician, studying electrical engineer, and owned an electrical contracting company and stuff. So, you know, I've been around at Cooler Wire since I was eight years old. Okay, uh, nice. I had to learn a little bit along the way. And he was you get, stuck, you get stuck in the theory and get way away from re reality. Yeah, and, and, then, and then it's like it's like okay, how do how do we how do we possibly show one instance of this theory? Yeah, well, I think it was interesting. I watched someone say, mention the other day that uh, in electrical theory you get very little. Uh, I think it was Ken Wheeler talking about electrical theory and electrical engineers how yeah. little uh, on um, you know essentially longitudinal waveform scalar waves and any of that sort of thing. We talk about electrons and the movement like electrons is electricity but what about protons um, and how does pro proton pumping occur in the upper atmosphere and for that matter how does proton pumping occur in the body the human? right this is the one yeah i mean it seems that it's high it's very incomplete and then it's been stopped to me I, I i'm seeing right right around the turn of the century there was so much interest in just el el electrical uh, investigation and experimentation and exploration, and then it, then the physicists got a hold of it, and then they kind of locked the whole thing down. And you know, the, the innovation in, in that that uh, exploration kind of halted dramatically. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, Edwin continuing his research and study into uh, the structure of the atom because. If we determine that uh, it is, in fact, uh, some sort of plasmoid instability in scale from the subatomic particle all the way up to plasmoid instability at the center of the galaxy and the sun and the center of the earth and the collisionless plasmoid instability that occurs at times in the upper atmosphere of the earth. So, um, you know, the idea that, that we need a new model for all these things to better understand them, the photoelectric effect and how uh, that occurs, I think we need to look into Bostick's work further on the uh, yeah, plasma yeah. stabilities. Yeah. I love just uh, looking at that. Actually. Bob Johnson's uh, plasmoid revisiting of the sun, and I think he provided considerable insight um, uh, for the electric universe community. I understand that Monty's doing good work with Sapphire. I appreciate that. You know, all of it's going to give us a better understanding. So, um, I have sort of a discussion starter, potentially at least. Uh, so, kind of continuing this line that you just spoke about, that of, of shutting down, so to speak. So, I, I'm just curious to hear everybody's opinion and, and Chris uh, uh, about uh, what. Well, I just have to have, have had this idea that. Uh, and it, 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 it might be a pretty long thing that I'm going to, to speak about, but, but hear me out, please. So in, in like, for example, uh, we've had this fossil fuel climate change thing, right? When people basically use the coal power plants, oil power plants, and things like that. But then we've had this Kyoto protocol thing, you know, this, this global warming propaganda and things like that. So so that that all became uh so people started, you know, closing the power and, and, and it caused many problems in different countries. Australia, for example, it's it's, it's in huge uh energetic crisis as, as far as I know because because they they've got rid of all their coal coal plants, you know. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I kind of envision the possibility that if, if those electrical influences would be recognized, like if it would become like a super mainstream, uh, don't you think that there may be sort of an electric Kyoto protocol, if you like? If it, when people would say that, okay, you know, that the electric devices actually pollute our environment so much that it becomes unhabitable, so we should get rid of them and this might be you know a, a sort of a possibility of, of starting a kind of a dark age if you like uh you see where i'm going with this i like, i agree that that the answer is not uh 
to fall back a hundred years in our technological advancement. What I would say is the frequency that we use uh, for communications could be different. And the oscillations that we transmit from all our devices and all our technology could reinforce life instead of diminish it. We know from the research studies that terahertz frequencies and airport scanners tear apart DNA, but we know that natural terahertz frequencies from the sun repair it. So that's the key is recreating those natural frequencies that would induce good health instead of ill health in the population and bring our planet into a healthy existence, maybe even change our consciousness to this process of evolving uh, the Schumann cavity oscillation. Right, right. Good question. Yeah. What's you the way I feel? Don't, don't, don't you think that it, it might be kind of, you know, a push to the limit by propaganda, even if it's not even correct in, in the first place, or, or not entirely Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. And, and there's, there's studies for both sides and they're funded for, from both sides. Uh, unfortunately, the telecom industry um, has gotten a clean slate. They can do anything they want to, you know, um, a, a, a blank check. And so the, the research, uh, United Nations uh, World Health Organization has listed cell phone radiation as a class two carcinogen. So we know that there's more and more research indicating that there is an effect, a biological effect from non-ionizing radiation, which has been their argument of thermal exposure from cell phone and microwave radiation. And that is a bogus argument because there are other effects that are non-thermal. And that's the question we need to discuss. What's your sense of what, what, what's going on with uh... 5, 5G and the rollout there and what's the... I think it's interesting. Good question. Uh, by the way, uh, I just did a talk in Sacramento uh, with uh, Environmental Voices and I discussed with them because they are a 5G city. Uh, the ability, in fact, telecom industries across the board about five to seven years ago started applying for application to deliver power remotely through wireless power transfer. And, and they started providing that. A San Diego company was granted a FCC license to do such uh, with some of their devices. Now, 5G has the ability to direct an energy beam to a point. And if you use multiple transmitters to a beam point uh, energy to a specific point, for instance, a box in someone's house or on a wall, it's possible to transfer energy through that process. There's a company out of uh, Waco, Texas named Visit that just recently got application uh, approved and has started producing a Zenic wave or remote power transfer globally. So um, they'll use uh, this low frequency oscillation and as a, a wave guide in uh, to work currents in the earth and transmit energy wirelessly. Essentially, my understanding is through driving a triad ground watch system into the ground and using their device. Is that out of is that out of Milford, Texas? Yeah, I think it is. And interesting, yeah, that's it. And interestingly enough, there's a company that's associated with it, and their name is Berkeley <laughs> Current Limited LLC. They're in the hair of the hair. They're picking up. <laughs> yeah. Different different that's type of hair. They're picking that up. Yeah. This stuff is thing. I didn't think they they would allow this to roll out commercially for some time now. I've known about the technology for a long time and how the Tesla tower is operated essentially by interfacing that energy between the atmospheric, atmospheric currents and, and those toroidal fields. Um, but, you know, the fact that they're rolling it out now commercially tells me that there's going to be uh, uh, exponential growth in this knowledge and, and the electric universe is poised right here, right now, to understand all that's going on in geoengineering and perhaps even the control of our solar activity. It, see, it seems to me that like you, one of the things that I saw you mentioning on the podcast uh, that, I, that I was watching was this use of, you know, like, just to, to kind of move a little bit to, like, uh, the, the, the harp installation in Alaska and then using... <laughs> You know, uh, uh, basically creating a resonance, uh, and, and then to amplify 
an atmospheric effect on, on, a, on a massive scale, on a global scale. And it's like, this is a radical, it's a, that's a radical technology. Yeah, I agree. And we talk about HARP as an as a, a idealized facility, but there are much larger, in fact, dozens and dozens of ionospheric heaters globally. Uh, even my understanding is one of the largest is down in Antarctica built just recently, but I haven't seen any documentation. So, but you know, we've had dipole based array antennas at uh, different locations around the world for, you know, since the fifties we've been building them. And, uh, you know, the heart facility in Alaska and get Kona, not far from where I lived, um, is just one of many. Right. Right. But the but the, the, the act of the, the act of doing this um, do, do, do they do it on a small scale to, in order to do it or is it basically they're testing on test just just using using the earth as a, as a, as a lab rat it's, a, it's an open air laboratory uh, these atmosphere tests have been going on for decades and decades and in fact um, the, the change of an Change in our electromagnetic environment, shooting resonance is, a, a, is one of the consequences of those variations and alpha wave perturbations in our atmosphere. My understanding is NASA's admitted that they can create new wave guides. They said so when they, they admitted they created the third Van Allen belt, right? And that was done through, um, my understanding is, uh, high altitude nuclear detonations, but the same technology that was under discovered at the end of creating an alpha alpha wave perturbation. Michael Carter uh, actually, actually I think was talking about that with his presentation when uh, extra rate yeah. form of the nuclear explosion nineteen sixty seven. Absolutely. In fact that was, uh, that was the early days of discovery of how this system was operating and yes. It was a, a, a there, there was actually a very impactful paper in two thousand and uh, 16 or 17, I guess. Uh, it was called uh, something like anthropogenic space weather, yes. or maybe some other words also were involved. So they discussed uh, in detail how these uh, high altitude nuclear, nuclear explosions uh, impacted the Earth and its immediate environment. Uh, in particular, yes, it. it, it injected lots of these charged particles that were released during the explosions into the Van Allen belts uh, and it actually uh, damaged uh, some of the satellites that were already in orbit at that time like it was uh, the, the very early 60s so that there weren't many satellites but still some of them I think were even like you know out of commission after that so great yeah great uh, this is, this is, by the way, this is a funny kind of additional argument towards, you know, the lunar conspiracy. Uh, if, if anybody is interested in that, like in the 60s, really, the radiation belts were much, much more dense because of these explosions that, that we do. Uh, by we, I don't mean we, I mean humanity. Yes, brilliant. In fact, uh, I, I think it's interesting to note that they've also experimented with uh, controlling uh, the radiation belts on uh, ejection of, of matter and ejection of uh, the energy through that circuit. So they're essentially learning to induce charge potential in that electrical force, electric field, wave guides in our um, upper atmosphere. And uh, it seems to me we were talking recently about the movement of the poles and the North Pole seems to be moving erratically and all about, you know, if you, if you change the angle of perturbation and you create an elliptical wave gut, and in fact, uh, electric force is a, uh, produces a magnetic field, wouldn't it be interesting to think that possibly the movement of the pole is related to the angle of perturbation of alpha waves in our upper atmosphere? Well, not only, you know, things on Earth are changing, but, but again, the, the sun is behaving uh, quite irregularly in the sense that, you know, the later, uh, the latest solar cycles are becoming weaker with respect to the, again, the 60s or 70s. 
the space age era. And there was actually a paper in 2014, I guess, that discussed a possible impact of, of that, uh, of, of the weakening of the solar activity on the manned space flight, for example, towards Mars and stuff, uh, because uh, the, uh, the dose of radiation uh, during these long-term space flights, like maybe six months or, or more, is mostly due to the cosmic rays, and cosmic rays, uh, uh, the, the solar activity basically reduces cosmic rays. This is very, very well known, very well established uh, correlation or anti-correlation rather. So uh, weakening solar activity would lead to more cosmic rays and much higher doses of radiation for astronauts, especially in these long-term flights, you know. So uh, the, the point I'm making is that uh, we see changes in the solar system, but uh, it might be related to the Earth mag Earth's magnetic field, not in the sense that Earth's magnetic field causes these changes, but vice versa, that, you know, everything changes, so Earth is also changing, and it's not, I mean, I think it would be really hard to prove that it's actually humans that are causing that, but, but, but who knows, again, yeah, this is an open question. I see, uh, I did some research on Cassini, Missions data and uh, and the recording of background radiation and they recorded a uh, uh, a higher background radiation cosmic radiation uh, when the sun was in an inactive state when the sun did flare in fact uh, it was still lower than the background radiation of cosmic radiation at that distance from the sun so you know uh, I'm I'm saying there's there's a lot of energy exchanging. You know, between the sun and the other locations, and the you know, we, you just mentioned the, the the Apollo missions and whether we had the ability to travel to those places then with the shielding available for uh, those craft. I don't know. It's a good question, but it would be more related to the background radiation in space than the radiation in the Van Allen belts, because I see them as a, a shield essentially from higher radiation, higher energies from deep space. I'm not sure if a few layers of mylar would take somebody walking around on the moon surface. That's all I'm saying. It's 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 amazing to me, you know, just the amount of if 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 it was kind of staged and everything. Because I was down there and I saw saw the, the the just the massive installations that are around the Kennedy Space Center, et cetera. But but it, it, what 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 an amazing like a, a amount of of material and endeavor. To, to not go and then say that you went. Well, what, what could you have put that money toward instead of actually? Exactly. The, you could have essentially built a Star Wars system, couldn't you have? Well, let's be fair, though. Know. They did actually, they, they, the development of the, of the missiles was really development of ICBMs. Uh, and, of course, there was a propaganda war and all this other stuff. And, there was a, there was no there was an under there was a unstated uh, a, a goal because remember Kennedy who was assassinated said prior to his death that we should be there by the end of the decade and so there was a need to make that happen now I'm not sure about the first one I'm pretty sure we went but the first one uh, you know I'm wondering about that it makes me wonder if they couldn't make it in time and that's why they there was a little skullduggery going on but clearly. Uh, there seems some clear evidence, like uh, you know, the dropping of the, the hammer and the feather and all that stuff. But maybe, you know, I, I I'd have to assume, like, because of the arc of the tires on certain, like, they were either in a giant vacuum chamber or they were on the moon. So at least I that that you know, uh, and obviously there's going to be like tons of engineering questions, just like you proposed. Like, can you survive this? Is the magnetic shield of the Earth actually going to protect the moon as well? Does it affect? All part like like you know there's so many questions. Of course, the well, it would it would yeah. no, it surely wouldn't. Well, not all of it does, does not does not go. No, no, at yeah, all. Oh. I mean, I mean, it touches the moon only in the magnetotail region, and it's 
it's it's kind of doubtful that you can call it protection. It's more it's more like additional, you know. <laughs> I suppose you're right. Uh, it was, it's only going to affect certain things. You're right. I mean, because not everything is going to be affected by the magnetic field. It's certainly not high energy photons or anything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to add to your comment that Saturn V that that launched Apollo or supposedly launched. Supposedly, <laughs> here we are. We uh, all be all. Be. Yeah, yeah, well, who knows? Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah so uh, it, it was actually not the ICBM. It was, I think, by that time when they were doing it, it was actually the first uh, rocket that was built specifically for, you know, space exploration, not for launching the nuclear warheads and stuff. Yeah, there was a big change. That, that was a huge beast compared to uh, the ones they had before, like the Alan Shepard one or three. Go on, yeah. Just go, just go back and read what Von Braun said it would take to get to the moon in the 1950s. Well, <laughs> I've, I've, yes, I've, I've, I've seen see such a huge missile. And Saturn V really is actually the big, biggest rocket that ever flown to this day, even to this day. It's amazing. I mean, you see, that, you, see, you, see, you see that you know in person. It's it's, it's like it's amazing. And Van, Van Allen recommended uh, a polar trajectory. I would have recommended one too. <laughs> it's like, do you want to go through those belts? Well, it depends on how much you want to be dead. Right there. You know, well, my those, thoughts, those but... belts, the Van Allen belt A and B are uh, different. Maybe Chris can speak to that a little bit because they are different. Yeah, proton and proton. Yes. But just a quote from Wikipedia, I take it for what it is. Right. Um, the inner belt has particles sitting around with an energy of about 100 mega electron volts. Now, my question is, is that, um, I don't know about uh, radiation safety limits, if you will, I'm not a nuclear engineer in that sense, but uh, particles with 100 mega electron volts sound very hazardous for human and machine. I would think yeah, that first being that? saturated in that type of energy would vaporize. From my understanding, the, the problem is yeah. once the ions hit your ship, which is basically aluminum, they start uh, giving off like uh, uh, microwaves and so forth, so they're cooking things inside the ship and so forth. So there's, I've heard lots of... Uh, uh, how would you get microwaves from 100 MeV? That's, that's gamma rays. Right? Well, okay. <laughs> I, it would, I wasn't trying to, to, I was just remembering what they were talking about. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, allegedly there are protons, protons, yeah. with 100 MAV. So there are particles that, that sounds utterly destructive to me. Yes. And I, apparently they go through uh, phases and yeah. so forth. And yeah. I mean, well, I, I actually doubt that, that figure, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert in Van Allen bills, not by a long shot, but, but 100 MeV, that's kind of like ultra relativistic protons, I would say. They're, they're like 99% of the speed of light, basically, aren't they? Well, there's a one heck of a voltage, apparently, in that ring current. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael Clary, Dr. Michael Claridge was talking about it. He was saying, well, every few yards you went, it was another 30 bolts and these steps occurred at, uh, you know, there was literally a millions, millions of steps. So you're talking like 30 million bolts in a current. I mean, that's going to whip material around like nobody's business, I'm sure. I read some specifications on satellite uh, uh, build outs and they were requiring 120 mega electron volt uh, protection shielding from for all their uh, electronics. So that's that's considerable. Obviously, they know there's high energy in space, and they, and they do talk about this now. Like that's one thing yeah. that they mentioned. Uh, like they said, what about going to Mars? What will we have to do? And they talk about it. And they talk specifically about how hard it is to get through these things. And I was like, well, then just use the same thing you went through last time. Like if if if, I mean, if you can stand on the moon without dying, then you can stand on the moon without dying, right? I mean, that, I don't. I mean, aren't they still alive? These people who went. <laughs> You know, so, uh, well, well, kind of to, to, to bring uh, a point to, to the other side of the discussion, of course, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, people, I mean, okay, we 
are not sure about the safety of human beings, let's say, but we definitely know that lots of, like, I'm, I'm talking about at least hundreds of space probes being launched exactly through these areas. For example, when uh, you launch a satellite to geostationary orbit, you should pass through Van Allen belts. Uh, and they seem, seem kind of okay. So, um, I think that's a good point. Um, the ability for a satellite to discharge electrical potential and that radiation build up in the shield, I understand it creates a plasma ion shield around around the satellite it does. Uh, with energy in, induced into this into that system. So and, it's uh, capacity, uh, sort of like that charge. And I think Tesla talked about uh, a Tesla shield, a mechanism by which to create an electromagnetic shielding for. Uh, and I know Boeing Corporation and North of Grumman has both been working on that technology as well. So. Um, the first you know, uh, satellites that went up weren't shielded, uh, and you could see the results of that. Actually, it's uh, the, the first pictures. I don't know if you if you ever have a chance to find them, and I'll see if I can locate them for people in the, the comments or whatever. But the uh, the uh, in the 1950s, the first satellites, the pictures they got back because they had to set the satellite up, take pictures, and then it had to land, and they had to recover it, right? Because it's not so they broadcast down or anything. But the pictures were. Uh, using uh, like basically had the emulsifier fluid and everything like that and they were printed right onto something but the footage that was on these things uh, you could see the sparks right across the, the film like there was unfortunately it had no protection so every time pieces of metal moved relative to each other and the met and the motors turned you know uh, they basically created voltage potentials which caused sparks inside this you know sealed box which of course lit the whole they got right, you know, so uh, it became obvious after the first few that we sent up that we're going to have to deal with this stuff, which should have been a big hint, if you know. But uh, to, yeah, well, to, to answer your question, Shifu, that you posted there, uh, the first man is awesome because uh, there's a Canadian as the main character. That's how that rolls. It's <laughs> <laughs> <Just> funny. <laughs> What's his name there? Uh, Gosling. Ryan Gosling, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's actually a second time you're asking this question on this podcast. Uh, so I have a question um, for you electrical engineers, you know, and others. Uh, background, I, you know, in a phase lock circuit, right? I did some work in DC communications with uh, control systems and such. And in a phase lock circuit with any circuit that's you know, has phases of two separate legs, for instance, on AC uh, 220, you know, or three phase circuits coming into a, a field. You have a short phase to phase, or you can have a short phase to ground, right? Right. And, and I wonder if it's just a simple matter of phase locked, of phase locking with the sun to create that, uh, 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 symbiosis, that, uh, that, that homeostasis in the system. And is that the key to control of the sun? As simple as phase and how we perturb that system on Earth in phase with the sun and how that interface occurs. I, I, would, I, I, don't know, I don't know kind of the electrical side of things, but I just want to kind of reemphasize this notion that we are actually connected to the sun by the streams of the solar wind. Uh, it's, it's the thing I was frequently mentioning in the chat of this podcast. Uh, the, the, you know, the so-called Parker spiral, how this, the sun emits solar wind and at the same time it is rotating. So we are connected to uh, some point on the solar surface, uh, slightly to the right of the center, actually like Half, halfway to the right uh, uh, limb, to, to the western limb, uh, uh, by these streams of solar plasma. And they, again, if you follow kind of mainstream uh, heliophysics, plasma physics, uh, they would say that the, these lines uh, of, of solar wind correspond to lines of magnetic field. So there's a constant kind of magnetic flux 
uh, fall, uh, falling onto the Earth. And uh, since this is a moving plasma, moving magnetized conductor, essentially, it kind of uh, could be considered as a generator of its own electric field. You know, a, a moving conductor in a magnetic field creates an electric field. So there's an electric field Very of, of solar color. wind. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, this is basically it's it's I think it's called the flux tube. This this stream of plasma with uh, following along the magnetic field lines, right? Uh, yes, so we, we might call it Birkeland current if you like, but, but, but that, that is kind of, well, never mind. So anyway, uh, the point I'm making is that we are connected to the sun and this is not disputable. I mean, even mainstream acknowledges this, this connection. Absolutely. And they've, yes. called, they've called it magnetic flux ropes at different times. Something like that. Yes, yeah. probably. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, when we, we talk about, like I mentioned earlier, magnet, a magnetic field is a product of an electric force, an electric field, and they have to be side by side. I don't know if you can have an electric field without a magnetic field. Is anyone aware of having a magnetic field without an electric field being present as well? Actually, even, even permanent magnets are... Uh, uh, based on the charges moving inside of the magnet and mostly doing those in a spiral, which is why it has a magnetic field. So, no, so they're all, as far as I know, and I've never seen anything that hasn't, but yes, there is a direct, I mean, the mathematics is clear. If you have this much magnetic flux and it is moving, you are generating this magnetic field, period. Like, just, but the uh, so answer, oh, sorry. Magnetic field as an effect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how this will. It seems. It seems intuitive to me personally. Yeah. But there is a. Uh, there's the cool thing that we're. The reason we even see a lot of these things, like I mean, the solar wind. If we weren't a solid body, most of this would just you know pass on by us, obviously. But given the fact that the Earth is the Earth, there's a solid surface. This solid surface means that the ionosphere and of course the magnetic field must sort of uh, move and adjust as it is uh, subjected to the forces of this arco-spiral solar, solar wind. And as it goes over this, you know, in a regular pattern, the, this movement of uh, the ionosphere and so forth, this rippling, is likely uh, the cause of most of the vibrations, uh, like in my opinion, of the Earth, not just, just lightning stars. I think lightning stars might be a result of this, more or less. Uh, and the surface itself is, uh, because it can't move, if there's movement on one plate, uh, let's say the ionosphere, and it starts moving back and forth, it's going to induce currents on the ground because the ground can't move. So there's, uh, I mean, it can, but you know, it takes a bit. <laughs> we don't want to get trapped in a paradigm, right? Where we say it can only happen in one way. Uh, I think uh, EU oh, Essentials 9.2 refers to that fact that uh, magnetic field, right, can induce an electric force uh, in a confined space or a magnetic uh, confined space um, and versa, vice versa that well, we, essentially we're talking about a, a plasmoid instability, a plasmoid or toroidal vortex, an electric force um, that can produce a magnetic field and vice versa. So they, the, it's a swinging door, guys, you know. Magnetism can produce electric force. Uh, electric force can produce the magnetism, and um, and we don't get trapped in that paradigm that we don't understand how it works and it interfaces together. Well, yeah, I think this is so. So, so your point is basically that the, the, the sun kind of uh, connects to us. Uh, I mean, we are connected to the sun, but the sun is also connected to us. Is, is that what you're saying? I believe that. Uh, the research I've seen uh, indicates there's a, a bi-directional flow in a, a Birkeland current filament. So there's current flowing in both directions. And I think it's that, that tension that locks us. I think they're calling it quantum trapping effect, but essentially locks us into that uh, rotation in a dynamic at a you know, faster than light connectivity as Wall talks about. So there's no time lapse in the movement of objects at great distance. So, um, if, I, if I may ask a question there, uh, um, 
the Van Allen belt, the inner belt is a proton belt between brackets. The outer belt is an electron belt. If I listen to Donald Scott about the uh, Birkeland currents, I hear it's like a, a tube within a tube. And I hear that there are op opposing directions, right back and forth, if you will. Yes. And, and that would be a proton and an electron going uh, beam or current or whatever you want to call it, flow. Uh, one way, uh, the proton going to the left and the electron going to the right, if you will. Now, if I compare that to the Van Allen belts on the Earth, uh, and to my mind, something like a wrapped around Birkeland current, a wrapped around the Earth picture comes up. Um, is there a silly notion, or can you speak to that, or is there a connection there? How does that work? Yeah, I, I, I think they've observed a Birkeland current filament in what they're calling an electrojet in the both polar regions of the Earth, if I'm answering the question properly. Um, and and I think, you know, uh, you know, um, um, Oh shoot! I, for some reason, that name just just left me. But uh, Bruce Labern talks about dual antennas and a, a toroidal uh, phenomena that occurs above points of, around the Earth as a uh, sea urchin model, right? And I think there's a huge axial right, and I think there's a huge axial potential around uh, uh, at both poles as evidence from both. D1, D2, and tied missions. So, you know, I, I think uh, well, uh, Kongpa, Dr. Kongpa, who uh, talks about Earth being three halves the wavelengths of light from the sun. And if you look at a, you know, sine wave, it seems to me the first planet is, a, is at the pinch point of the, uh, a Bennett pinch point at the first half sine wave. and. Uh, Mars and, and uh, Mercury, and then you talk about the second planet being at the second pinch point of, of two halves of wavelength of light, and Earth being at three halves of wavelength of light. It seems to me that that would be symbolic of a, an octaves, right? Eight planets, eight octaves, yeah. and eight pinch points where those planets exist. I think uh, Philip Francis uh, sent me a picture of a uh, null Earth image which then showed a, a triangular configuration of the wind currents at the South Pole. And we know that uh, Mercury has a single dot at its North Pole. And uh, Saturn has six, a uh, hexagonal configuration at its North Pole, six planets. So, you know, I, I'm just saying that is this connected? It very well is connected to a Birkeland current filament in the wavelength of light from the sun. And why the planets are locked in trapped into their orbit at those positions. Uh, can you say also, doesn't Jupiter have uh, I'm sorry, they were all uh, yeah, I actually I actually can say because I watched this Juno video right today. So Jupiter has eight storms on the northern pole but five on the southern. Oh that's it's, you know the fifth fifth planet so but but, but you know uh, the, the, there's an interesting Possibility here that this north south. Did you uh, notice, notice those difference. are in Fibonacci numbers? Wow. I don't know if you noticed that. Are they? Yeah. Eight, eight. I, I think Bruce, Bruce uh, talks about like just the number of the planet. Oh, no, it's just, it's just eight and five. Like they're, I mean, okay. Saturn has yeah. this hexagon, which is six storms essentially, yeah, and Jupiter true. has this five storms on sample. But anyway, I, I wanted to comment to Ido's uh, question. So there's a an important and kind of unrecognized maybe uh, philological problem, I guess, in the EU community that uh, what what EU people call Birkeland currents are called just, I mean, we call everything Birkeland current, you know, in a way, uh, we call uh, any current that is aligned with the magnetic field a Birkeland current. But this is not what uh, regular physics does. In, in physics, the, the, the current that is aligned with the magnetic field is called field-aligned current, and that's all. But Birkeland current 
uh, again, in regular mainstream physics, is specifically the current that is uh, flowing in, in the polar regions of the Earth and maybe right. other planets, but mostly the Earth. So, so you've asked, you know, about Ber uh, kind of Van Allen belts possibly being the manifestations of Birkeland current or something. So, the, the kind of, you know, uh, taking into account what I've talked before, uh, there is a Birkeland current, uh, <laughs> but, but, but maybe there is a, a field aligned current, which is kind of a larger, uh, that is also like, I mean, uh, associated with Van Allen Bills, right? But that's one of the, but, but these Birkeland currents that, that kind of fall straight into the poles, they were actually uh, pretty comprehensively studied in, in the recent years. There was a, uh, a press release by ESA, uh, European Space Agency. Uh, you, you probably know they have this SWARM mission, I'm not sure what, what what is the acronym here, but but it's called Swarm. It's three satellites with good magnetometers that are orbiting the Earth uh, and measuring the magnetic field. Uh, so they they tried to you know uh, basically measure these Birkeland currents, uh, what mainstream considers Birkeland currents, right? So this is kind of a, only a, a, a part of what you would consider Birkeland. A, 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 how do you call it, the uh, specific case, right? So, uh, okay, so, so, so anyway, I, th I, think, I think I said what I wanted. So. Well, I thank, you, I thank you for that answer, Eugene, but if you see that picture that is on top left, um, I'm not sure who's sharing the screen there, whereby, um, now, if I'm not mistaken, this is a depiction of the Birkeland currents at the North Pole, for example, right? That's the stuff yes, that's top, yes, uh, so this is, this is exactly what mainstream names as a Birkeland current. But, but is it EU? That's my question first. Uh -huh. Oh, is it? so so would EU consider this a Birkeland current? Is that yes? Yes, oh, because, because that's a great question. Because it seems to me, and this is just me as a, 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 a I'm not an electric engineer, right? But if I look at the picture, I can see a, a, a flux a flow coming in on the left and out on the right, and the other one is reversed. That is the same mechanics, and that is allegedly a broken current, at least how it's explained. And so my question is, are these a direct result of that, of those two um, Van Allen belts, if you will? The, the light brown, the darkest brown would be the inner belt, and the lightish brown orange would be the outer belt. That is my connection. I'm trying to understand how the broken currents that are there, allegedly, how they connect to this Earth system? Are they indeed going to the sun, or are they spreading around around the Earth as a Van Allen belt? That's that's kind of my question. And if that is totally wrong, please tell me that it's totally wrong. Actually, you know, the argument that you're having no. right now is the same argument that Berkeley and Cindy Chapman had way back in like the uh, like way back when. Uh, he. Uh, uh, of course, but we're not having an argument. No, no, I just mean in regards <laughs> to that big, that debate. Is the uh, the magnetic field of the Earth uh, a separate entity, like a, the magnetic field of a of a magnet, basically, or is it connected? Uh, and of course, this was the argument way back when. And it turns out, of course, that uh, the according to space probes and stuff, that it looks like Berkeley was correct. And uh, uh, but what we're I think what we're seeing is. In this particular case, uh, these the, the currents are obviously completely um, uh, different in this, like what we normally see in a in a Berkeley current, because the magnetic field is starting to pitch it down to the globe, and then of course that's why we can see it, the aurora at all, because it's accelerated and pitched to such high densities that we can begin to see it. It begins to cause synchrotron radiation and so forth. So. Anyway, just to answer your question. And I think it's representative more of a of a funnel effect, uh, a spiraling funnel, rather than a phenomenon as we see right there. And and in in if you look at Kongpop's model as a wave function um, of light, um, then it may be 
indicative of a, a sine wave entry and a cosine wave exit at the South Pole along the trajectory. But I really like that that discussion uh, that Eugene was having um, with, I believe, J Jimmy, um, Jim on you know, the alignment of the planetary axis. Is, and so, I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know the answers, but what I'm saying is that I, I perceive it as being a filamentary connection. It could be in a byway phenomena, as Eugene was describing, uh, twisted along that core filament of a Birkeland current where each planet exists. I don't know. So, um, you know, but uh, the Birkeland current, as defined by mainstream uh, science is different than the EU's understanding from my understanding of Don's model. So I think it's a discussion. If you have a, a, a information or energy transfer along a plasma filament or waveguide, it should form very similar to the structure of Don's model for Birkeland current. So uh, if there is any type of electrical interface, it should form in that model when it's highly active. I almost want to hear Jim hop on. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to. I went, I'm not Jim, unfortunately, but I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe finish, but maybe not this discussion. So uh, I can answer to Edo that you can consider this what mainstream calls Birkeland current, a Birkeland current in EU terms. It's just that mainstream only considers, you know, this particular realization of EU's Birkeland currents as Birkeland currents. Yeah, <laughs> only this so one part, if you will. Yes, yes. So yeah. they, they call only this this part Birkeland currents, whereas we refer to Birkeland, uh, as Birkeland currents to all, all all the other possibilities. But these yes. Also that, demonstrate all the all the properties that, for example, Don Scott speaks about. They demonstrate counter rotation, and and they, again that that press release by ESA that I, I referred to previously clearly states that there are you know cylindrical shells of these currents right. with opposite direction of rotation. So this is a genuine EU Birkeland current, and even mainstream names it Birkeland current. You could uh, go up, Dave, if you would, a little bit. Uh, besides that wonderful one showing the jumps uh, across the equator there, and up a little bit further, you can see the jet, uh, one that shows the looks like has the red and blue kind of great part of your oh, mouse. Okay, there. so anyway, yeah, right. and I also want to answer to Edo about the Van Allen belts. So uh, the mainstream version of it, and I, I, I cannot guarantee that it is correct, but it, it basically boils down to the notion that uh, what Van Allen belt is, is essentially kind of a storage uh, of a charged particle, particles that fall onto the Earth from everywhere, like the sun and, and the galaxy and stuff. And why they become kind of trapped in these zones is because, uh, well, naturally charged particles follow magnetic field lines. This is just the way plasma behaves. But, uh, when, so they would kind of try to fall into the polar areas, right? Where the magnetic field lines exit or enter the Earth's surface. But as they are doing that, as they are kind of trying to fall into the poles, of course, some of them do fall. And that's why we see auroras, for example. That's why we see higher radiation levels in polar areas and stuff. But, but, but uh, many of these particles get kind of reflected from the poles because there is a higher density of magnetic field lines, if you like. There's a higher strength of the magnetic field. And just if you look at the equations that describe the, the, the dynamics of plasma, the higher magnetic field strength causes the particles to kind of reflect from this. This is one of the fundamental basics of how magnetic mirroring works. Uh, maybe you know that uh, in, in some of the plasma machines, they have, for example, two coils with current, and you can contain plasma between those coils of current because the, the plasma would want to escape uh, along the magnetic field lines through one of the coils 
but as it approaches it, it, it counters the higher magnetic field strength and it reflects backwards. So it kind of bounces back and forth from one coil to the other. And pretty much this is the same as, well, yeah, this is exactly the, the picture. So imagine, imagine we took one of these coils and kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a hard thing to imagine, but imagine we kind of invert this whole picture so that the particles are jumping not inside, but outside. If you can, although I, I know it's pretty hard, but that would be the, the exact picture of Earth, you know, uh, where the particles jump outside of it in this torus, right, kind of trying to reach those coils at the poles, but, but they cannot, at least some of them cannot, because there is this mirroring happening. Well, and there's, yeah, that's where you get the uh, sort of like, because uh, if you have a rotation in that, then you're going to have a a ring around the middle of those charges because that would be the uh, Van Allen belt, so to speak. And you're having a, uh, you're basically creating the, the, the Faraday effect, you know, getting torque, and rotation, and so forth. Uh, and uh, I can see the uh, possibilities that you're that you're looking at a, uh, I guess you could say a, a more complex system because it's a sphere. It's not going to do the disk thing. Uh, and you're going to have uh, loops and so forth, which is what we see. We see this. Uh, we see the the atmosphere and the uh, the plasma connections, which are we see from uh, that are actually there uh, between the, the north and south hemispheres and so forth. So uh, clearly, it's not uh, is efficient. Uh, it's like uh, uh, like recognizing that it's uh, imperfect and it has a lot of uh, inefficiencies in the system, which is probably why we have so much heat going on under the surface of our planet, too. So, it's starting to look like the counter rotational dynamics of a plasmoid instability to me. Mm -hmm. so the Bostec. Uh, you know, being being exposed to him a bit and diving in, and it's like that that that, that thing is uh, really it's certainly plastic. resonating on many levels. Oh yeah, the pl plasmoid model, and, and and if you start looking at these uh, geometry building blocks of uh, fundamental geometry as a relation to oh, harmonics, you start looking at the uh, idea that uh, electron is a vortex phenomenon, for instance. right? Right. So. You know, I think we're on the cutting edge of discovery and we'll eventually get to the answers. But a change in the atomic model as Edwin's working on is brilliant. I love the uh, atomic geometry. And now we need to describe the electrical interfaces that occur uh, between atoms and even subatomic particles and a dipole electrostatic force across the ether, as I believe exists, possibly charge frequencies, uh, neutrinos, but the measurements of the energies in space are astronomical. Um, yeah, there's a lot more there than we think, that's for sure. 2,900 tera electron volts measured, I think. Measured, that is astronomical. Literally. And we had as one another. Yeah, literally, yeah. And we start. Then we start considering the phenomena of astrophysical masers and the ejection of essentially all the building blocks of nature. They talked about us being stardust. Well, maybe it wasn't dust. Maybe it was a, a plasma condensing into what we know as matter. Water on the Earth is a product of those phenomena in space. The Earth itself ejects uh, water in huge quantities, so it's not a closed system. Not right. That's, I mean, that's the message that seems to be coming through. It's, it's this this uh, continu continuum, that the, the missing piece of uh, of the model. It seems to be to be this. Uh, we've got the, ra the the radiation part all together, but we don't have the other part where it comes where it comes back in, in, into you know in, in, into into a focal point. And we're seeing the, the things we've been exposing or not exposing. But on the uh, on the show is you know the sonal luminescence and then uh, uh, cavitation and all these things that, that seem to me to be part of the same system. It's just well, yeah. part of it. I, I understand the phenomenon of cavitation well, and and my question is, isn't that in fact a, a plasma? 
provides more instability, a hydrodynamic sphere. That seems like it, right? Absolutely. Well, water, it almost seems like everything's cavitating in a way. Water actually carries a, uh, does carry charges, uh, and because it's inside of it. So technically water moving, uh, can, it, it could technically be a weak plasma. And of course, under pressure, the certain dynamics would change. But, uh, I was thinking about, uh, the way that I believe we only have a few more minutes. So I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask Chris some amazing questions, but the idea is that the, the, uh, not just the sun and the earth and the connection there, but see what you were talking about, Dave, the idea that uh, there is something that bridges these gaps, that, that is connecting all of this. And compared to the predictions that have been made, and we have to acknowledge in the electric universe or plasma cosmology models, either one, I'm not going to disparage either uh, at this point or critique them, but they have uh it or forthcoming compared to if we think about it how long before the uh, uh was it the lander that landed on venus uh it was the uh, it was a russian lander and before it got there i mean we they had to know they had to know because they made this thing incredibly tough with diamond lenses and everything else it still only lasted 15 minutes on the surface of venus but this uh, this late, this predictions were, but it was just right up until they went there, they thought they were going to see trees and life underneath the clouds. So, and then of course, then Carl Sagan comes in and goes, oh, it's so hot, even though Velikovsky predicted it, but it's so hot because, uh, because of the global warming effect, runaway global warming, greenhouse gas thing. And that right there, that one statement is, still affecting us today because look what it's done and it was an ad hoc throwaway comment trying to explain without actually explaining just making something out of your butt and just pulling it out there and throwing it down which is not what science is supposed to do at all you can't just keep on making ad hoc additions and keep on destroying the the predictive accuracy of your model and this that alone should be reason enough for these people to turn and look you know, like the electrical engineers, they, they say not only does the ether exist, that you're wrong there, but and they've been saying it for 125 years. But hello, <laughs> look at this. Look look at the, the what, what you what you have now. Look at what you're talking about. Magnetic field shift in your first hint. I'm done ranting. I've, I've ranted away. <laughs> Someone else. Uh, I, just, I just want, want to have no. I'm sorry. I just want to have a short comment about. I mean, you, you mentioned life on Venus and things. So there is a guy in, in Russian, uh, kind of a more or less mainstream scientific community, although he, he's pretty old, uh, uh, that uh, have basically spent the, the, the last, I don't know, a couple of decades of his life, I guess, uh, in studying the pictures of these Soviet probes that went to Venus. And he, he's uh, kind of obsessed with the idea that they actually resemble, you know, that they that something is moving there, you know. So those might be like alive organisms or something. Well, that actually uh, really surprised me. Look what we have at the, I mean, we thought that there would be no life at the vents of uh, the black smokers on the middle ocean ridges. And yet we go down, there's this dark and sulfurous atmosphere and yeah bacteria live right on the side of that thing so it wouldn't surprise me at 900 degrees you, i mean it might be possible yeah 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 i just i just wanted to mention this because i mean there's a whole community of people studying the pictures of mars and like seeing all kinds of stuff there yeah but that's also <laughs> but, uh, looking at clouds I, 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 too, I just, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that, that, that there's this thing about Venus too. So yeah, I've um, I've heard about that before, Eugene. Not very much, uh, but I did come across it. It was very fascinating. And at first, I dis 